The shear and moment diagram in this video is as hard as it gets. So if you can follow along and you can solve a problem like this one, you'll be able to solve any shear and moment diagram that you would be asked in your statics or mechanics and materials course. So the beam you see on the screen now will have every type of loading that you'll see in these courses. A point force, a point moment, a rectangular distributed load, triangular distributed load, and a distributed load represented by a function. So the steps to solve this problem and every problem is gonna to be to first, do a free body diagram to solve for reaction forces. Then step two, draw the shear diagram using the beam drawing. And then lastly, draw your moment diagram by integrating your shear diagram. So reaction forces, then shear, then moment. This problem is as hard as it gets. Let's go. I'm Dr. Bernard, engineering professor. Shear and moment diagrams are introduced in statics when you learn about internal forces. The internal forces being the normal force N, shear force V, and bending moment M. And shear and moment diagrams are a great alternative to doing the method of sections at every individual point in the beam. The purpose of the shear and moment diagrams is to solve for these internal forces everywhere, all at once, so you don't have to individually solve for every particular location. In mechanics and materials, you'll actually use the results of these diagrams. When studying bending, you're gonna use M, the maximum moment that you find on the shear and moment diagrams in order to determine whether or not your beam will actually fail in tension or compression when subjected to bending. And the shear diagram is gonna be used for shear, in particular, transverse shear. So in your mechanics and materials course, when you get to your chapter on transverse shear, that's where you'll be using the maximum value for V that you found on the shear diagram. In order to find the reaction forces, which I labeled in purple as FA and FB, I'm first gonna need to turn the distributed loads into point forces, which I've labeled here in green, F1, 2, and 3, at distances X1, 2, and 3 from the left-hand side. For a triangular distributed load, the point force is just gonna be the area of the triangle, one half base times height, and the location for that force is going to be one third of the base closer to the tall side. For the rectangular distributed load, the point force is gonna be equal to the area of that rectangle, base times height, and the distance will just be right in the middle of the rectangle. For the distributed load represented by a function, finding out the magnitude of the force is the easier part of the two, and that's just the integral where the bounds of integration are the length of the base, and the function being integrated is the function itself. Finding the location is a little bit more complex. If you think of an integral as Riemann sums, then finding the central of this shape is essentially a weighted average of the location of each of those Riemann sums. And a Riemann sum is a rectangle with height f of x and base dx. And so this red underlined section is the area of each rectangle of the Riemann sum. Then this blue underlined x is the distance of this Riemann sum from zero. So by adding together all of these distance times areas, and then by dividing by the total area, that gives you a weighted average, which ends up being the centroid for the shape. So the results of my integral here are 1.5, but I actually need to be a little bit careful because looking back at my picture, the distance that I just calculated is actually only this distance, 1.5, which is not actually x2. In order to get x2, I need to additionally add this first 1.5 that represents that beginning part of the beam as well. So my total x2 is going to be three. Now that I've solved for all the distributed loads, time to actually do a sum of moments and sum of forces to find the reaction forces. So I started by doing a sum of moments about point A, and once I plug in all of the numbers, FB will be the only unknown. And plugging in numbers and doing a little bit of calculator work, I get a value for FB of 43.357 newtons. And to solve for FA, I'll do a sum of moments in the Y direction with all of the forces still present, but this time the moment is not included in this equation since it's a moment, not a force. And I get an answer for A that is negative 29. So a negative answer is not necessarily wrong, it just means that the arrow was drawn in in the wrong direction on the free body diagram and that that pin joint on the left hand side is actually pulling downwards instead of pushing up. And looking at the picture, it looks like a lot of the forces are sort of designed to push down on the right and push up on the left. So it does make sense that this pin would be holding down that left hand side. So if you wanna take a moment to relook over these steps to see how I solve for the reaction forces and in particular, 
how I found the location of that functional distributed load, you may want to pause the video now because I'm about to erase the whiteboard and you'll have to go back. So I've started my shear and moment diagrams by just giving myself a, a vertical line down that's going to be the left hand edge. And I drew some yellow lines at each point of interest where it looks like something is changing just to represent a really thin dashed line, maybe uh, with your pencil, that's just a visual guide. It's not part of the actual drawing. So for shear and moment diagrams, they're both always going to start and end at zero. So first thing is I put two dots there to remind myself that they have to start and end there. So point forces are gonna be an instantaneous jump. So at point A using FA, I'm just gonna draw a line straight down to negative 29.857. And it's down because even though the arrow is pointing up, the value is negative. So next is gonna be the triangular distributed load, the 10. So if a triangular distributed load is going to decrease at a parabola shape. Here I've drawn a concave up parabola because the tall side of the triangle is on the left. So that's where the slope will be steeper. The right side has a value of zero of the, the right side of the parabola is at the low end of the triangle, which would be then a horizontal slope because the value of the force there is zero. And the value for the point of that location is gonna be shifted by the area of the triangle. Since the area of that triangle is 7.5, which was force one, I go down by an amount of 7.5 on shear. So the next force we get to is a 40 Newton upward force. So that's just 40 straight up, which brings us to a positive 2.6. For this function, I know it's going to go down a total of 16 because that was the magnitude of the point force, which is the area of that curve. So I can go ahead and write in that point, that negative 13 right now. For drawing the shape, it's gonna be a cubic function. The main thing to worry about is getting the concavity correct, whether it should be concave up or concave down. Or since the value of the force is zero on the left-hand side, this means the slope of shear will be zero on the left-hand side. And then since the force gets larger to the right, it means that the slope will get steeper to the right. So this is gonna be a concave down shape. Now at point B, there's another upward pointing force, FB at 43.357. So I'll just draw an arrow straight upwards uh, to a total of positive 30 which is the negative 13.3 plus 43.3. And then lastly is gonna be the red rectangular distributed load at a slope of negative 15. This distributed load had a point force of 30, right? It's slope of 15 times a value of two, which is good because since we're at a current position of 30, that will bring us straight back down to zero. And that's a good sign that I didn't make any math errors as I was solving for reaction forces or making this shear diagram because if I had made any math errors anywhere, I probably would not end up back at zero. So if you are solving a shear and moment diagram problem and you don't end up back at zero on the right hand side, then there's a good chance that you made a mistake somewhere along the way. It might be difficult to find where that mistake is, but it's in there somewhere. The moment diagram will also start and end at zero. You don't have to work from left to right like I did in shear. In this case, I'm actually gonna start working from the right and go left a little bit, simply because it's gonna be easier. In order to solve for the values for moment, we're gonna to need to solve for the areas of shear. And the left-hand side has curves versus the right-hand side is just a point moment and a triangle, so it'll be a little bit easier starting from the right first. That clockwise moment of 25 Newton meters is a positive direction moment, but that positive direction means when going from left to right. So going from left to right, we expect to end up at that negative 25 so that that positive 25 Newton meter moment brings you back up to zero. And I'm using that same logic here for drawing the triangular portion. The area of that triangle is one half base times height. It has a base of width two and a height of 30. So one half base times height is 30. And since that triangle on shear is above the X axis, it's gonna mean positive moment. So that means that going from left to right it will be increasing. So going right to left, I drew it as decreasing. Now the tall side of that 30 triangle is on the left. So that's why my line here on moment is steeper on the left. And then that triangle goes down to zero on the right hand side, meaning that it's actually horizontal on the right hand side. So it starts off steeply and then goes to a slope of zero making a concave down shape. Now because this middle section of the shear plot crosses the x-axis, I've added an extra dashed line because where it crosses the x-axis is gonna be a maximum or a minimum. In particular, we know it's going to be a maximum because to the left of that point, the shear diagram is positive, which means moment will be increasing. To the right of that point, shear diagram is negative, which means it will be decreasing. 
So that green line is going to be a maximum. But either way, that's probably one of the hardest parts of this problem. So I'm going to jump all the way over to the left side of moment first and come back to that middle part last. So starting from the left, I need to find this red shaded area. I've already actually drawn the line on my moment diagram because I know it's going to be decreasing because that area is below the X axis. And I know it's going to be concave down because the point on the right hand side is lower, has a larger magnitude than the point on the left. So it means the right hand side will be steeper. But to find the actual numerical value, I'll have to do some calculus to integrate to find that area. In order to integrate to find the area of that red portion, I first need to find out what is the actual function of that curve to be able to integrate. So I have to go all the way back to the force diagram with that 10 Newton per meter triangular distributed load. Now, because of the concavity of the parabola, I'm actually gonna define my X axis, my zero location, as being the short side of the triangle. And I'm gonna look at that triangle as being a line sloping upwards with a rise of 10 and a run of 1.5, making a slope of 10 over 1.5. And again, a y-intercept of zero because I'm defining that location as my origin. So since shear is the integral of that force, I can integrate that 10 over 1.5x and get 10 thirds x squared plus the constant of integration. That constant of integration is gonna be this y-intercept, which is that negative 37. So I added the calculus on the screen, but I wanna sum up this step overall, is that first, I started by writing the triangular distributed load as a function going upwards from the zero point of the small side of the triangle. I integrated that to get a parabola, which is the line for the shear diagram. And the constant of integration was the actual point on the shear diagram where the zero slope is located. So then integrating this one more time, but doing a definite integral will actually give the area of that shape. And this value, negative 52, is negative because it's underneath the x-axis. And this negative 52 value is then the value to actually label on your moment diagram. So there's just one piece left to finish this diagram now, which is the section in the middle. However, if you're in a mechanics materials course and all you need to find is the maximum moment in order to plug into the flexure formula to find out if your piece will break due to bending, you could actually stop right now. You can already tell from the diagram as is that negative 55 is going to be the maximum moment. And this is because you know, based on that shape in the middle, that from the negative 52, it will be increasing until it hits that maximum at the green, and then it will be decreasing till it gets to the 55. So by finding these two points, this negative 52 and the negative 55, we know that the parts in the middle can never be lower than that negative 55, so, that negative 55 Newton meters would be the maximum moment. However, to complete the shear and moment diagram, you would actually have to draw this middle portion as well. So in order to learn more about this middle section, I'm starting with the parabola on the original drawing, negative six X squared. And I'm calling that negative, even though the slope looks like it's a positive upward pointing parabola, Remember that all of the arrows are pointing down. So in this case, I'm gonna use it as negative so that that negative sign will reflect the downward pointing curve that's in the V diagram. And I've defined my X axis, my origin in this case, at the left hand side, which is essentially the zero part of the parabola. And so the constant of integration is that value 2.6, which is the starting point of that cubic function then on the shear diagram. And because it's really easy to make a mistake when doing this calculus, it's a good idea to check the point and and so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna check the right hand point since I know what value that is on shear. So by plugging in an X value of two, I get that value of negative 13, which means that this curve does look like it actually does match the shape. So before I can integrate the shape to get areas, I need to find where that green line is located, that value that I've labeled here as X1. And what I do know about that is that this function is gonna have a shear value of zero at X1. So I plug in zero for V and solve for X1 to get this value of 1.09. And so what I know is all of the area from zero to 1.09 is positive on shear, which will be increasing on moment. And all of the area from 1.09 to two will be negative on shear and decreasing on moment. So I've set up my two integrals, which will be the two areas, left of the green dash line and right of the green dash line. So completing those two integrals, I get an area of positive two on the left-hand side and negative 4.8 on the right-hand side. Now, hopefully, 
As I draw in this line on the moment diagram, as I add this 2.1 to the negative 52 and then subtract the 4.8, hopefully I should get to negative 55 on that right hand point. If those two points don't meet, then it means I've made a math mistake somewhere. So I've drawn in the two curves. They're both concave down because they should have a slope of zero at the maximum and be steeper on the left and right hand sides. So when adding the 2.175, I get a value of negative 50.110 at that maximum. And then when subtracting the 4.889, I get to a value of negative 54.999. And we'll say that's close enough. And that's it. So this is basically the hardest problem you could possibly be asked in statics or mechanics and materials for shear and moment diagrams. If you are brand new to shear and moment diagrams, this video probably went way over your head. But if you have a little bit of experience already, I hope that this has helped to understand how to do more complicated versions of shear and moment diagrams once you already have a solid base. So if you're interested in seeing more videos like this, consider subscribing to my channel so you can see each new video as they come out. If you just really want to watch another video right now, YouTube's got a couple of recommendations up on the screen for you to choose from. Thanks for watching and enjoy the rest of your day.